Well, good morning. Hello and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium. And this session is Syntax Matters, Developing Sentence Skills for Reading and Writing. Um, my name is Karen Brady and I am joined today by my colleague, Sharon Fowl. We are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. So just a few housekeeping items before the session starts. Handouts for this session at the Patent Literacy Symposium Schoology account. Uh, those session handouts are in within that folder for today in the time slot for this session and under the name of the session. The session is 75 minutes long and it is being recorded. The chat feature will be off between participants, but you will be able to chat with me if you have any needs. If, okay, please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. Uh, our presenter today is going to ask for um, chat uh, responses at predetermined times um, so that you can, just, um, you can just chat to me and I'll relay those at those times. We would love for you to tweet or share on social media everything that you're learning here in the symposium. The hashtag for the Patent Literacy Symposium is hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. And now we would like to introduce you to our presenter, William Van Cleve. William Van Cleve is in private practice as an educational consultant who specializes in morphology and written expression an internationally recognized speaker with an interactive, hands-on presentation style. William has presented on effective teaching practices at conferences and schools, both in the United States and abroad since 1995. Recent projects include consulting with three schools as part of a literacy, literacy grant in Montana, participating on the MTSS Writing Standards Committee for the state of Pennsylvania, implementing several trainer of trainer projects using his sentence structure approach, and writing a series of workbooks and a companion book on developing composition skills to complement his sentence approach. The author of three books, including Writing Matters and Everything You Want to Know and Exactly Where to Find It, as well as a number of educational tools and activities. William has served as a classroom teacher, tutor, and administrator in the private school arena at various points in his career. So I'd like to welcome my friend and colleague, William Van Cleef. Good morning, everybody. I am super excited to be here with you guys uh, um, from all over the state and probably all over the country. Um, I am uh, zooming to you from Louisville, Kentucky uh, in my kitchen. Uh, the virtual world is kind of an exciting place to be. Um, I just want to point out one thing here. My website is on that front page and you can see that there. There'll be a little bit more opportunity for contact and information at the end of the presentation as well. Um, I have to tell you, if you're participating in my morphology workshop later on, this is going to sound bad, but syntax is my favorite topic. Um, I would rather talk about this than pretty much anything on the planet. And uh, I'm excited to be sharing ideas with you guys uh, about that topic this morning. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is do just a little bit of terminology with you. And I, um, I am reticent about using the term grammar when we talk about syntax. And I've been pushing away from the term grammar increasingly in my own professional uh, life and also in my work with students. Uh, in part because grammar can mean two things really. And the first thing it can mean is sort of the grammar of a language. So you have something like the grammar of English or the grammar of Spanish. And it's this overarching framework of how the language works. But we also use grammar to talk about a very, very specific kind of nitty gritty labeling and parsing and, and identifying of parts of speech and things in sentences. Um, and I think that term grammar, when you say grammar and you could mean two very distinct things, um, that's problematic for me because when I say something to you, I want you to understand it as I, uh, as I send it to you. So I've increasingly been using the word syntax to think about what we're going to do today. And I'd like you to look at just that middle point there. Um, and if you don't already know what syntax is, basically it's the arrangement of words and phrases to create well-formed sentences. So the shorthand version of that is it's word order. So in English, we have a syntax or a system of ordering words that makes communication effective and manageable, both for the speaker and the listener, both for the writer and the reader. And what you'll find is that syntax varies across different languages. So I'm just gonna give you a very simple example to frame our discussion. In Spanish, 
there are a number of situations where there is an understood subject. The subject is not explicitly stated in the sentence. In English, we only have one scenario where that happens. It's called the imperative or the command. Something like go to your room has an implied or an understood you. You go to your room. In Spanish, though, there are lots of situations where you have this understood or implied subject. So if I'm a native Spanish speaker learning English, I'm liable to drop subjects when I'm speaking English, when I'm translating uh, into English, etc. Um, that would be odd or jarring to a native English speaker. And the reverse is also true. If I'm an English speaker and I'm learning Spanish, I'm liable to insert subjects where a Spanish speaker wouldn't insert them. And that too would be jarring syntactically. So sometimes when we think about a foreign language uh, translation, like I'm learning a second language, something like that, we think about learning the words, the vocabulary words in that language. For example, table in Spanish is mesa. But there are also syntactic variances between languages that can make them difficult for students. So Luisa Motes, who's a keynote, I think today actually, um, says, the order and grouping of words within a language system allows us to understand relationships among the ideas, such as subject, verb, object relationships. And our syntax basically follows a subject, verb, object framework. There are variances, but when you listen, you expect me to start with a doer or a subject, the do, the verb, and then some sort of object. So this is kind of a, a play with syntax that's kind of fun. And just take a second here and look at the placement of the word only. It's the only thing I've changed in these sentences and see what happens to the meaning. And then I'll point out just a couple for you. So one thing you'll see is if you take the second one, for example, she told him she loved only him. So there are lots of people she's spending time with, but only he is receiving her love. If you look at the, the bottom, it says she only told him she loved him. There were other things she could have told him, but that's the only thing she chose to tell him. And you'll find that each of the sentences varies that, that understanding just by the shift of the word. So word order can just offer you options but it can also significantly impact the understanding of the sentence. So there are kind of two camps in the syntax or grammar world right now. On the left side, we have camp one. And camp one is learning terminology and identifying and labeling those parts of speech and sentence parts is a necessary component of ELA and makes better writers. Teach grammar in isolation. So that's camp one. This would be um, somebody who downloads a teacher's pay teacher's packet, perhaps of 50 pages of underlining nouns and has kids underline lots and lots of nouns to practice that underlining activity. Camp two is teachers say explicit grammar instruction is useless as an activity. It wastes valuable time and it makes students hate writing. Teach grammar incidentally as problems arise in student writing. And I just want to give you a little bit of a scenario so that you understand what this kind of uh, a syntax or this kind of camp involves. Uh, let's say I assign a paper to my class and they go home and they write their papers and they come in and, and I collect them. And I find that five of my students of my class of 25, five of them are writing super short, uh, little choppy sentences. And I say to myself, wow, these kids could really benefit from some sentence combining. So what I do is I pull them aside at a round table, perhaps in the back of the room, and we have a little mini lesson where we address sentence combining. And we look at their paragraphs and we combine those sentences, um, some of them, and we try to increase um, the length of the sentences. And, and we do that as a hands-on activity. And I may even give them an opportunity to resubmit the papers now that they've done some of that sentence combining and think about how that looks. So that's camp two. And that is grammar is taught only incidentally as problems arise in student writing. So we've got some problems with both camps that I'd like to identify for you today. Camp one, we've got two problems. One is we have decades of research. We may even have half a century now of research that says that grammar instruction does not improve writing. And two, typically when grammar is taught this way, students learn to fear or loathe it. So they're not going to like the instruction. They're not going to like the concepts. Uh, they're not going to get a lot out of it either. 
All right, but camp two has some inherent problems as well. First, when we teach grammar incidentally as problems arise, when we teach these syntactic concepts, when we see something that appears in student writing, we don't provide students with an overarching framework to show them where the concept they're learning about fits in the bigger picture. So this would be the equivalent of, if I'm a, a, a primary uh, teacher, this would be the equivalent of my instructing students on the letter A, but not providing them the framework of vowels and consonants so they would know where that A fits and how that works. Two, there's not enough practice to internalize concepts. So one of the things we know about our struggling kids is that they probably don't need a different way of learning it. So they don't need, when they have their pull out, or their intervention time. They don't need it taught with different language and different concepts. That's actually liable to confuse them. But instead that they need that instruction reinforced, maybe slowed down, repeated, and that they need additional chance for practice. So if I do a mini lesson where we do a little sentence combining and they, they fix their paragraphs, there's really no indication that that knowledge will translate into the next time they write paragraphs. And frankly, in the big picture, I don't care how that current paragraph looks. I care whether they figured out the skills they need to make their writing better on the long term. Also, third bullet there, we have no link between writing and reading comprehension. We're not making that connection between students as writers and students as readers. And finally, we have no development of a common vocabulary or language to talk about sentence structure. So what, what I want you guys to realize is learning words like noun and subject and, and predicate, that's not really about knowing what those words are. It's about allowing us to communicate about sentences and ideas and comprehension. So we need to keep our eye, eye on the ball. Um, it's not about knowing what a noun is. It's about using the term noun to talk about these people, places, things, and ideas. So I've kind of visualized or envisioned a uh, camp three. And in camp three, we're going to use the language of syntax to facilitate better writing and reading. So we're going to keep our eye on the ball, if you will. We're going to make sure that um, our instruction is targeted at making better readers and better writers. And we're going to challenge ourselves when we're doing something and we can't really perceive how that's making kids better readers and writers. We're going to teach concepts using a logical sequential approach. I don't mind the many lesson where we're doing sentence combining, but we're going to give them the opportunity to understand how that fits into their overarching understanding of the language. Third, we're going to avoid rote memorization and excessive labeling activities. So if you don't know what rote memorization is, I'd just like to pause there and tell you, rote memorization is the memorization of meaningless disconnected facts. There are some rote memorization activities that are important. Say, for example, learning the multiplication tables. That's vital for advanced math. We're going to need to know those and we're going to need to be comfortable with them. But there's also a decent amount of rote memory that is not useful for our learning. And a lot of the things like memorizing long lists of prepositions really aren't useful. They don't have an impact on the way students read and write. In fact, they're probably likely to be confusing to the kids. And finally, we're going to create reinforcement activities that engage students in genuine reading comprehension and writing practice. So we're going to make sure that the activities we do, that the things we work on with students, they're building better readers and writers. If a concept does not improve student reading and or writing, I want you to challenge yourselves and I want you to say, you know what, I don't think I should be teaching this. Why should I be teaching this? Um, and then think how best could I use that time in another way to improve their writing and reading. So a couple of research things. Number one, sentence combining has a strong positive effect on writing. We know this in study after study. So I would argue to you that if you're not currently doing some sentence combining in your writing instruction, you probably should think about that. Two, research, uh, recent research indicates that grammar taught as it applies to writing has a strong positive effect on writing. So if we use that grammar instruction embedded into making better writers, we actually get a much better research effect than we would if we taught it in a vacuum, in isolation. And finally, syntax study can improve reading comprehension at the sentence level. And our final slides and our final thinking is really going to send that, that message home to you folks. It is not enough to teach the grammatical system. If this teaching is to affect writing, then it must be explicitly applied to writing. 
All right, so we have two major syntactic conf, uh, concepts to cover today. First, we're going to talk a little bit about parts of speech. And second, we're going to talk about the really powerful stuff, these sentence parts. So I want you to keep two big ideas in mind today. One is that parts of speech is all about the job, the function, or the role. And the second piece we're going to be layering in is that sentence parts are all about the clause, that that's really what we're focused on. So this is parts of speech or POS. Again, we focus on the role a word plays. We focus on the job a word has in a sentence. Using parts of speech this way builds student writing and comprehending because it builds in students the ability to understand the way words work, the way they relate to one another to convey meaning. So a lot of our work with identifying or labeling, and we do a little of that when we do this effectively, a lot of our work that way is thinking about the way a word works with other words in a sentence. And when you do that, you're inherently building in comprehension discussion. So I've got these four words for you, and I'd like you just to take a minute and jot down what part of speech you think these words might be. Just take a minute on your own. I know there are too many of you to have a share out after that, but do a little bit of thinking. So you can imagine a kid having this discussion, and this is a super useful, powerful conversation to have with kids. And at first uh, a breath, kids are going to shout out that man is a noun. I think you can imagine that happening in your class. But you can also man the lifeboats. Um, I had a, a teacher recently say, you could also use it as an interjection. You could say, man, it's hot today. Um, uh, so, so you can think about this word and say, wait a minute, this word isn't always a noun. This is about the job it's playing. This is about its function. You can also think about a word like jump, and you know that jump is a verb, and your kids, even uh, four and five-year-olds, would be able to tell you that that's a verb or an action. But you can also have a ski jump. You could also have a jump start, and that might be kind of a compound word, but it also might be describing start. Sock is a fun one to do with kids, not to act out, but to talk about, because obviously a sock is a noun, and they'll say that, but you can also sock it to me, and that would be an action. Look at something like smooth, and smooth is an adjective, but it also functions as a verb. I want to smooth out the bedspread. So I've given you some answers here. So if you wanted to be really, really syntactically nerdy when I gave you this question, you would say to yourself, well, I can't answer that question because William didn't use them in sentences. And that would be a great way to think about that. Um, but it wouldn't be a way that would get the kids really thinking. So I want them to sort of try something and then to have them experiment, what have you. So it's a great comprehension discussion to have with kids. And you can do it at a pretty young level. So parts of speech, what works? Number one, we want to keep introduction brief and straightforward. We don't want to overdo it. Two, we want to keep identification of various elements to a minimum. Don't do too much labeling. There's too much labeling going on uh, right now in classrooms. Three, we're going to focus primary teaching time on generating and discussing good examples. And four, we want to remember that as students get older, they have typically studied the basic parts of speech multiple times already. Be ready to review quickly and then expand the depth of their knowledge. I frequently encounter middle school teachers who say, you know, my students don't know what adjectives are, so we're going to have to do a big lesson on adjectives because they didn't learn it already. And I would argue to you that by eighth grade, these kids have had adjectives several times, if not multiple times. And what you really need to do is quickly refresh the knowledge of, oh, wait, adjective is the one that describes or modifies a noun or pronoun, and then move on to the more advanced stuff that's going to be vital for these kids to build their syntactic awareness. If your students haven't generated any examples or practiced the concept in their own speaking and or writing by the end of the lesson, you've missed the boat. Okay, so this is from my book, Writing Matters, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about this because I think it's really important for our thinking. This is about function and relationship rather than about a memorized definition. So for example, my noun and my pronoun are touching, and they are both in navy blue because they replace each other. They are interchangeable in a sentence. 
Adjective is also blue because it describes those nouns and pronouns. And it's also touching the noun and pronoun right underneath to show that it relates to the noun and pronoun to show that it describes or enhances that noun and pronoun. But it's not navy blue because it's not interchangeable with the noun and pronoun. If you look at verb, that's green. A lot of the color-coded grammar systems do green as verb because it's like go. And the adverb is underneath the verb. It describes that verb or it modifies that verb. Adverbs can do other things, but at the basic level, this is its most important value. Now notice I've got my noun on the left and my verb on the right because eventually our subjects and our predicates are likely to be left to right just like this. Now we have more than one noun in a sentence frequently, um, but this, this framework sort of sets us up for syntax. And over on the right, you have preposition and conjunction. And these two words are not touching because they're not related to each other. But the preposition allows us to introduce phrases and the conjunction allows us to join words and groups of words. So they are both expanding or elaborating or allowing us to do more with sentences. Most of my students, if you laid these cards in a stack in front of them, could spread them out in this format and show me and show themselves the relationship these words have with each other. All right, so I actually developed this model for Patton, which is ironic because I'm presenting it here to Patton. This is the IECC model for parts of speech work. And there are four pieces of that. Identify is a traditional labeling activity. It helps students identify the element in pre-existing sentences. This is a small percent of our instructional time. Remember, I do wanna do a little bit of this, but I don't want this to eat up my entire lesson. Two, I've chosen two activities in two and three that are research-based and allow kids to build and think about syntax. First, a sentence expansion, where you give them a bare bones sentence or the first part of a sentence and you ask them to expand or develop their thinking. And second, the sentence combining. I already mentioned to you folks that this is a research-based activity. We're giving them short choppy sentences or shorter, more simplistic sentences and asking them to combine them in interesting ways. And finally, don't forget, we don't wanna miss the boat. This part four is to create sentences, that we're sentence creating, we're sentence writing, we're building sentences. And what the research tells us, folks, is that this kind of model is best used when it's about text we are reading and studying. So I wouldn't want to do this in isolation unless it's just at the initial moment of instruction. And then I want them writing about Charlotte's Web or To Kill a Mockingbird or Hamlet or whatever it might be. I want them to think about how the, the uh, writing enhances their understanding of the text. And then when you do something like sharing these out in the classroom, they're not just reviewing and practicing with syntax, they're also reviewing and practicing with the story or the text they're reading. And by the way, I mentioned three pieces of fiction. You could absolutely do this kind of thing with nonfiction as well, with something from sciences or social studies or something like that. So very briefly, I just wanna review, not all the parts of speech, but just a couple to enhance our discussion about job. So remember that parts of speech are the job or the role that a word has in a sentence. So young and red in my first example are indeed parts of speech, adjectives that describe the child in the wagon. Now a little student, a young student might say, well, they're adjectives because they're in front of the noun. And that's problematic because in the long term, that's not going to work for the student. This is not about location. It's not about form, it's about function. What are they doing? And if you look at the second sentence, you'll see that rich and delicious, in fact, describe brownie and that they are not in front of brownie. And one of the neatest things you can do with young kids is to get them to ask them the question, what is delicious telling us? And to get them to think through this process and get to the point where they say, wait a minute, that's describing the brownie. That's comprehension for you. Because if you look at those words, brownie and delicious have three words between them. Delicious isn't in a tidy little spot before the noun. So that's really allowing us to think about comprehension, to think about the way delicious works with brownie. So these are sentence expansion examples. And you'd have something like the children and their leaders took vans to a campground. And you would expand with adjectives. And you might notice there are uh, 
four nouns in this, children, leaders, vans, and campground, and I could add adjectives to any of those. Over a campfire, the children roasted hot dogs and sang songs. Again, I have uh, four nouns, uh, campfire, children, hot dogs, and songs, and I could be adding adjectives to any of those. So I've just put in some examples here, but what I would have the kids do is, I would have the kids create sentences and I'd have them share. And if these are based on a story, they would have to be adjectives that work with what we know about the story. So these are sentence combinings. And one thing I'll tell you about these is the first one is extremely elementary and pretty straightforward. The second one is extremely advanced. So um, there really isn't an intermediate one in these two examples. So my grandfather told jokes at the table. He is friendly. His jokes were funny. Pretty much gives you a single answer. There's one kind of right answer, if you will. Whereas number two, there are a number of options. So my friendly grandfather told funny jokes at the table. That's pretty much the way kids are going to do this if they're accurate. But for number two, look at my options here. And this isn't even all of them. Um, I've seen 12 to 14 different options for this one. My hungry sisters and I listened to the jokes and ate nutritious snacks prepared by our dad or that our dad had prepared or our dad had prepared or that were prepared by our dad. So you've got lots of different options and you can even start the sentence with something like our dad and reshift the entire syntax. And you can see that at the bottom. Our dad had prepared nutritious snacks that my hungry sisters and I ate as we listened to the jokes. There really isn't a wrong answer as long as you don't change the meaning and as long as you don't write a fragment or a run on. So a warning, memorizing lists of words and tricks to identify certain parts of speech defeats our purpose. It focuses attention on labeling rather than on understanding, and it often misleads rather than informs anyway. So I'm just going to show you adverbs to show you an example of where this can happen. A lot of elementary teachers teach that adverbs often end in ly, but I want you to think about what that does. What that does is teach kids to look for ly words when they're reading and to mark them as adverbs. That's about labeling. It's basically about seek and find. It's about searching out words that end with ly. It is not about understanding the content or thinking about how adverbs describe or modify verbs or the other things they can modify. So in the first example I've given you, he is a friendly guy. And that, in fact, friendly has suffix ly, but it's clearly functioning as an adjective. So that's also misleading when you teach them about these ly words. And I would argue that friendly is a word that most of our children know as a vocabulary word. It's a pretty straightforward, clean word. The second example is, I never did my homework yesterday. And I have the words never and yesterday. Both of those are adverbial. They're both describing did. Never, in fact, is telling... Um, uh, if you did it, whether you did it, you didn't. And yesterday is telling you when that happened. And yesterday, again, is several words away from the did. It does not end in ly, but it is telling when. And when I ask kids what yesterday is saying, they might say at first it's talking about the homework, but they'll figure this out. And through thinking and good questioning, you can really get them to think about the fact that yesterday is describing the, is, is telling the when about this did piece. So that's a cool comprehension thing to do with kids. So there are two kinds of conjunctions in the language. These are the most powerful parts of speech, and they're under-discussed, and they're under-taught. So a coordinating conjunction, if you can see my fist, I'm going to show you a little kind of visual for this. A coordinating conjunction keeps two things on equal footing. In fact, co means with or together. So Jane and Sue in the kitchen or on the porch. John went to the store, but it was closed. Neither one of these is more important than the other. That coordinator is with or together. No one is in charge. And these coordinating conjunctions, to be honest with you, uh, kids are using these way before school at three and four years old. Subordinated conjunctions are the most powerful words in the language. They have one function, they begin the dependent clause and they make that clause dependent. And they, are, they pack a wallop in terms of comprehension. A lot of them are tier two academic vocabulary words and they really have a significant impact. So these are a little different. 
Sub means under, like a submarine or beneath. So when you have two things and a coordinating conjunction, they stay on equal footing. But if you look at my fists again, if you have a subordinated conjunction, it takes one group of words and it sends them underneath the other. That's powerful. And I can tell you that four and five-year-olds usually don't write or talk like this. They write, excuse me, they don't write, but they talk in coordinated conjunction structure, but they don't talk in subordinated conjunction structure. The standards have us introducing complex sentences, which include subordinated conjunctions, in mainstream third grade, and kids are ready to grapple with those and think about them at that grade if they're mainstream kids. You'll want to adjust your thinking for kids who struggle, um, and they may be dealing with this a little older. Okay, so important concepts for the language. The two most important things I can teach you about the language are subject predicate and the building block clause. And what I worry is that kids learn about adjectives again and again and again throughout schooling. And they don't have time as they get older to really get into the clause structure because we're so busy reteaching parts of speech again and again. This is powerful stuff. Subject and predicate can be introduced to first graders. And we develop our understanding and the nuances of these terms as kids get older. The subject to start with is who or what is doing the action or the doer. So we're going to focus today in our limited time on simple subject. That's the blue word, man. The predicate is the action or the do. So again, we're going to focus on the simple predicate. That's the word eight. So our core is the man eight. And the research tells us that if we cannot find the subject and predicate, we don't know what the sentence is about. We may not know the words subject and predicate, but if we can't find that doer and that do, we lack syntactic comprehension, and that's a problem. So I've got several examples here for you. The ferocious dog barked at my friend. A storm in our town took down a lot of trees. Several boys and girls, you can see that whole thing is underlined. That's because that's a compound uh, subject. Played in the park on Saturday. And I ran and skipped down the street in the rain. You might wonder why I is underlined and it's just that one word. I is both the simple subject and it's the subject with all of its describers because guess what? In this scenario, there aren't describers, are there? It's just I. So these subjects are the important building blocks, the doer of the sentence. And then the predicate is the action or the do. So this is the other side of these sentences. Barked at my friend, took down a lot of trees, played in the park on Saturday, ran and skipped down the street in the rain. So these words, these words uh, are, are our predicates or our do. So one of the coolest things you can do with kids is sentence frames. And what you do is provide a picture. So one of the ones I do with kids is a roaring bear. And one of, one of the things you wanna make sure your pictures have is some sort of action. So a mountain range wouldn't work very well. Two people sitting on a park bench wouldn't work very well. You've got to have a do. So a roaring bear works really well. I actually just did this a couple of months ago uh, in Denver with some five-year-olds. It worked really, really well. And what you do is you put the bear up. He's clearly roaring. I actually think this is a female bear, so she's clearly roaring. And I asked these kids that were 15 or 20 uh, five-year-olds, what's happening? Lots of hands up. And one of the kids said, the bear roars. And I said, good, we're going to say roared just to be a little easier. And I do a lot of oral language with them. So I say, the bear roared. And everyone repeats after me, the bear roared. Oh, good, that's awesome. What else could the bear be doing? And the kids are looking at this bear. And this little girl in, in Colorado, she was so great. She raised her hand. She goes, I think the bear is singing. Now, I can tell you, this was a pretty scary bear. She did not look like she was singing to me, but that's fine. I was like, that's cool, the bear's singing. And then one little boy said, the bear's talking. It's like, okay, again, this bear did not look like he was talking, but maybe, maybe uh, he or she is talking. Um, that's fine. So we played around with that language. We're playing around with the core components of subject and predicate before we're even really thinking about sentences, what have you, because these two building blocks, they're what is going to give us these complete sentences. So eventually I put up the bear roared. We had heard some different options. And I said, I'm going to go with the first one, the bear roared. This is a good one. Let's look at this. 
And then through questioning, we elaborate and we expand. What kind of bear was it? What color was the bear? Do you notice anything about the bear? And what I ended up with the kids was the ferocious black bear with sharp claws. Now I gave them the word ferocious, the rest came from them. And I think one of the kids said scary. And I said, I'm gonna give you a big word for scary. I said ferocious, I wanna use that powerful academic vocabulary. The students all repeated ferocious to me. And I said, that means super scary. And we talked about that and we even acted it out. We put on our scary faces, our ferocious faces. So I had them repeat this a lot. One of them said black bear and I said the black bear and we all repeated that. And then one of them noticed claws and I said good what kind of claws they're sharp and then I said the black bear was sharp claws and we all repeated that. So lots of back and forth coral, um, coral work. And then I turned to Roared and I asked them questions like when, where, why, and how and we ended up with this and actually these words all came from the kids. So again, every single time we added something, I had them re-repeat it. So we're building that syntax together. This is at its core, the bear roared, but there's a lot else going on. And the kids were so excited and proud of their sentence. You can do one of these picture prompt uh, subject predicate uh, do or do pieces every day with kids. It doesn't take longer than 10 or 12 minutes once they get into the rhythm. And they're thinking about and they're working with syntax even before they're comfortable writing these things out. So the most important thing I can teach you in this workshop is that the subjects and predicates are built into units called clauses. These are the building blocks or the Legos of all sentences. We combine clauses in different ways to show relationships between groups of words and to increase sentence variety. A clause is a group of words with a subject and its predicate. This is vital information and you can start teaching third graders and up this concept. A clause is not necessarily a sentence. And I can tell you folks that teachers often try to make clauses about sentences, but luckily for us, students rarely do. They're pretty st stuck on the idea that a clause is a group of words with a subject and its predicate. Some clauses can stand by themselves and some can't. So what I do with kids, let me go back to this one, I'm sorry. What I do with kids is I have them sort things by whether they are clauses or not clauses. And this is actually not as difficult as some of you might think. What we're looking for when we find clauses is groups of words that have these subjects and predicates. If we can't find a subject and a predicate, guess what? We don't have a clause. That's something else, it's a phrase. I do a lot of sorting of these. I do bell ringer sorts. I do them on cards and have them sort them into stacks. I do them on the document camera. Lots of different ways of working this important concept. So within the framework of clause, there are only two kinds of clauses in the language. And syntax is relatively tidy and straightforward. It's a pretty clean understanding. There are exceptions, there's some weird things, but overall we're in pretty good shape. There are only two clauses in the language though. There are clauses that can stand by themselves. These are independent. And there are clauses that cannot stand by themselves. And these are dependent. And these two building blocks combine to build all different kinds of sentences. And that's what gives us our syntactic variety. That's what gives us the flow of ideas. I had a teacher just last week and she said, this all seems very kind of controlling or rigid or, but it's just the opposite. When you learn these building blocks, when you learn these components, it gives you a huge array of options to build different kinds of sentences. And in turn, it allows you to understand the sentences others have written, sentences that are built of these same building blocks. So I tell kids they're like Legos and we put them together in different ways to build different structures. So these are independent clauses. You will find since they're clauses that they all have subjects and predicates. You will also find that they can stand by themselves. So they could in fact be sentences. I painted a picture, subject I, predicate painted, that's a clause. The teacher walked into the room, subject teacher, predicate walked, that's a clause. And it's an independent clause. My friends drank all the tea, subject friends drank uh, is the predicate. Again, that's a clause and it can stand by itself. These are dependent clauses. And what you'll notice is they cannot stand by themselves, but they do still have these subjects and predicates in them. 
because in order for something to be a clause, it must have a doer and a do, a subject and a predicate. While I was napping, I was napping as my subject and my predicate, but it can't stand by itself. If I walk up to you and say, while I was napping, something else is coming. You know there's more to my, my idea. If you finish your homework, you and finish are my subject and my predicate. If you finish your homework, sets up a leaner or a dependent clause, um, there's more to come. And after we got home from school, again, we got subject and predicate, but that is a group of words that cannot stand by itself. So it's a clause, but it's dependent. All right, now we're going to use these to build sentences. And this is so powerful for kids to have this knowledge and this framework to think about language. A simple sentence is, all it is is one independent clause. So I've got two options here. They're both simple sentences, believe it or not. I slept, that's simple. It's also super simplistic. But the second one is not simplistic. And what I want you to recognize is that simple sentences are one subject predicate relationship, but they could be quite sophisticated, interesting sentences. So in the virtual presentation, William provided an overview of syntax to what I hope is eager participants. That is also simple. It's a subject predicate relationship, but it's not simplistic. It's not a baby sentence. It's not a little idea. There's a lot going on, but I only have one subject predicate. All right, compound sentences. So our compound sentence is two independent clauses. Now, if you've ever heard a three or a four-year-old talk, you know what they tend to do is about seven independent clauses with about six ands. And you're thinking to yourself, do I get a turn? And they're actually not thinking about you're having a turn. You know, we went to the store and we got chocolate candy bars and we put them in the card and my mom let me buy all of them and I ate three in the car. And you're just like, okay, when is this going to stop? And it's not. Um, and they tend not to breathe a lot when they're doing this. It kind of runs on. So that is actually a super, super straightforward, multi-component compound sentence. So they're doing these really, really young. They're ready to talk about compound sentences in first grade. But remember what I said to you folks, the, the clause structure piece I wouldn't introduce until third grade. So in first grade, instead of talking about independent clauses, I would talk about complete thoughts or complete sentences. So starting in third grade, we talk about two independent clauses and they're joined by a mandatory comma. That's nice to know. It's nice to have punctuation make sense. And one of these seven words for and nor, but, or yet so and they spell a cheesy little mnemonic fandoms. John went to the store, independent clause, stands by itself, complete thought, comma, gotta have it, but coordinating conjunction, it was closed. Now folks, remember, I mentioned the coordinating conjunction, look at my fists again, that's the one where neither clause has more power than the other. Neither concept on the other side of this word, they're both on equal footing. And that's part of why little kids can do this. And at the bottom, I mentioned to you, first and second graders use and, but, and or. They don't need fanboys. In fact, I would not do that with them. Um, but they don't use the term clause. Okay, so you can do this with super, super young kids with no real problem at all. They're gonna be fine with this. So I gave you some examples here. Not super vital for our a reference. I'm not gonna read these aloud to you, but do be aware ones like for and nor are much more difficult uh, than the ones like and and but. And that's one of the reasons why we don't do fanboys uh, with the younger children because they're really not ready for the advanced coordinated conjunctions. Okay, the most powerful syntactic structure in the language is the complex sentence. And I can tell you that if I took a class of fourth graders and I collected their writing and I sorted them into the ones you thought sounded good in terms of sentence structure and the ones you thought sounded not so good, let's pretend for a minute that all of what they wrote was complete sentences, no run-ons and no fragments. Even if you did not know what a clause was, even if you did not know what a complex sentence is, the ones that you would think sound advanced or more sophisticated are the ones that would include these complex sentences. 
So when I teach kids this concept, when we introduce this and reinforce it and practice it and introduce the language that goes with it, we are really working a much more advanced way of thinking about writing and a much more advanced way of organizing ideas. This is going to build a better writer, but it's also going to build a better comprehender of written text. So our complex sentence is one independent clause and it's one or more dependent clauses. And they follow two basic patterns to start with, a D comma I or an ID. And you can see that right in the middle of the slide. The dependent clause begins with a subordinated conjunction. So guys, whenever is one of those. And remember I used my fists and I said the subordinating conjunction takes one group of words and it sends it underneath. That's what's happening here. So in my first example, whenever it rains is a dependent clause that's subordinate to my main idea. I forget my umbrella whenever it rains. I like ice cream, main idea, big thought, because it tastes delicious. That's the subordinate thought or the secondary thought. So this is fun to do with kids actually, but I want you to take a look at these and all I've done is replace the subordinating conjunction and look at what happens to the meaning. These conjunctions are powerful. While I studied, my sister ran screaming through the house. That was during that time. After I studied, she waited until I was finished studying. That was nice of her. Before I studied, she got it out of the way before I studied. Because I studied, now we're moving into kind of a mean mode, right? She chose the time when I was studying to run screaming with intention. Although I studied, it's like, you know what? I was studying, she should have known better. And whenever I studied, uh-oh, this is a daily occurrence every single time I study. Um, so so as, as we're framing that word, and there's some others, like as soon as is a pretty funny one too, because it's like she sat there behaving until the moment when I started studying and then she started screaming. So you can see these conjunctions impact meaning. Having kids look at these and think about how they change the meaning is a really powerful activity for reading comprehension and also for writing. So then you could take this away and say, good, now I'd like you to take one of these, generate your own sentence. Let's talk about what that means and why you chose the one you did. Okay, so our final sentence type, if you will, is the complex sentence with an adjective clause. And the reason I, for today, the reason I pose this one to you folks is because it's imperative that kids understand these for reading comprehension. They typically show up in standards around sixth grade, but I'm gonna tell you that I often show kids these earlier than that. I often show kids these to, for text, even as early as fourth grade. I wouldn't have kids write them that early, but I would have them look at them in text and figure out what they mean. And here's why. They're going to see these in textbooks before they're in sixth grade. So I want them armed with the tools they need to understand what they're reading. Remember at the core that a complex sentence has one independent clause and one or more dependent clauses. While some dependent clauses begin with a subordinated conjunction, others begin with a relative pronoun or an adjective. These special relative clauses always follow the noun or pronoun they are describing. And the, pro the pronouns we're going to talk about today are who, which, and that. So hang on with me here. These are hard, but I want you to really think about uh, what these do for kids. So look at number one. The doctor who was nearing retirement still had a great skill with his patients. Okay, now, who was nearing retirement is a dependent clause. It has a subject who, it has a predicate was nearing. And this group of words, this orange group of words describes the word immediately preceding the doctor. That's why we call these adjective clauses because they describe the noun or pronoun right before them. Now, what makes these weird is they're in the middle oftentimes of the independent clause. 
the ones we were looking at before, those are not in the middle. They're at the beginning, they're at the end. They're kind of clean and straightforward. They're where you'd expect them to be. These are jarring. They interrupt the core piece of the sentence. The doctor still had great skill with his patients. They're right in the middle. Why is that tricky? Because when I read something like number one, I have to hold on to doctor while I'm reading the orange part, if you will, and then come back to the main idea again. I've got to hold on to doctor in my working memory while I'm reading all this stuff. Look at the second example. That table, which is a million dollar antique, will never leave our family. And again, that table will never leave our family. But I'm providing you this extra little offshoot information right in the middle. And that's tricky. There are two big reasons why this is a tricky. And the first one is this kind of sentence, this particular kind of complex sentence, it often appears in expository text. So it's not going to be about Jane and Mike taking a walk in the park. It's going to be about photosynthesis, or it's going to be about the Revolutionary War. So we're going to be grappling with challenging syntax and content that is new or unfamiliar to us. That's a double whammy. Also, what Cheryl Scott and her researching teams discovered was that the further the main subject, that's doctor in number one, is from the main predicate, had, the harder the sentence is to understand. So basically, in short form for this slide, the longer the orange part is, the harder the sentence is to understand for the kids. So that's a big comprehension aha. And when I do syntax workshops around the country, when I'm working with teachers who are not ELA, not special education, not EL teachers, I find that this is the thing that wins them over. So my science teachers, my math teachers, my history teachers, they say, wait, I've seen these in my text. And I say, yes, exactly, this is what's happening. And they say, now I'm beginning to understand why some of my kids are having a lot of difficulty getting the information out of this text. Okay. So they can also be at the end of the sentence. These are some uh, there. The ones that are really challenging to understand though are the ones that break up that subject predicate. So look at number one. I spent hours preparing the chicken dish which was delicious, nutritious, and well-prepared. That's at the end, it's describing the dish though. It's still describing that noun right in front of it. Mark watches any show. No, he doesn't. He watches any show that holds his interest. Certain kind of shows he watches. I handed the outfit to Sue, who looked at it with disdain. That's about Sue, not about me. And we could talk about what disdain means as well. Okay, so this is my uh, Cheryl Scott slide. A growing body of research indicates that comprehension is connected not just to vocabulary, but also to syntax. A student must understand 90 to 95% of the words on a page to understand the content. Many of you have probably already heard this statistic. However, a student can also understand all the words in a text and due to syntax, still find that text incomprehensible. So the number one impact on reading comprehension is vocabulary, but the number two impact is in fact syntax. It's a distant number two, but it's number two. Consider these two examples. Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. He was born in Kentucky and had three children. Now, here's version two. Abraham Lincoln, who was born in Kentucky and had three children, was the 16th president of the United States. Clearly, the second option is more difficult to comprehend, but it's also more interesting and sophisticated. Research again says, the further the main subject is from its predicate, the harder the sentence is to comprehend. Okay, so I wanna think about the lesson and what the components of the lesson look like. It's a little harder to do this in a webinar than it is in an intensive uh, interactive um, virtual training because I can't model all of this for you, but I wanna talk to you about these pieces. First, the instructor introduces a concept clearly and succinctly using both a visual and a verbal description. I don't need to overteach. 
I don't need to teach this for 40 minutes. We know our students are going to tune out on lecture anyway after a few minutes. Let's get the core concept up. Let's talk about it. And then let's move into interactive activities that would practice it. If I didn't do a good job teaching it, teaching it for 20 more minutes isn't going to help. I'd rather work that out in my examples with kids and say, oh, wait a minute, I need to clarify that. I'm going to go back to my teaching mode and I'm going to explain something further. Number two, students identify the element in pre-written sentences. This is a brief portion of the lesson. And I would do, um, uh, I think Anita's presenting at this too, an I do, we do, you do model. I would do a few examples for the kids up on the board. I would have them help me with a few examples. And then I would have them do some pair work where they're identifying together. And then I might send them home with a little bit of independent homework, but not 30 examples, maybe five, maybe seven if I'm gonna push my luck. Students conduct activities such as sentence expanding, sentence combining and unscrambling, sentence imitating to practice their knowledge and application of the given element. So this is the transition step between my instruction and my identifying and the actual creation. Students create their own examples, students share those examples, and the instructor uses those examples to clarify and expand. So when I'm doing this in a classroom setting, the students are going around the room taking turns, they are reading their examples, whether that's an adjective that describes Charlotte in Charlotte's Web or an example of a complex sentence. We're going around, we're exploring those, all the students are sharing. Why? because I'm getting progress monitoring data out of this. I don't wanna just have the same three kids raise their hands every time. I only know that those three students understand the content when that happens. So we go around the room, we share, we can do some of this as pair writing, we can do some of this solo. And when they're sharing, we get to check, first of all, do they know how to build a complex sentence? And second of all, do they understand what's happening in the book holes or whatever we might be writing about? So we get double bang for our buck. We get a syntax check and we also get a text comprehension check. And I can tell you that ELA teachers across the board, when they do a section of the text, the next day they come in, the first thing out of their mouths is, what did we read about yesterday? Sometimes we can use sentence writing as a way of proving that knowledge, of exploring that knowledge, and of checking in with the kids to see how they're comprehending. So we introduce briefly, we identify briefly, we expand, combine, unscramble, imitate, etc. Then we generate, we share, and we discuss. That's the core framework for our lesson. So these are materials. Just take a minute and say, these are focused on syntax. Um, they're available on my website. Just wanted you to the opportunity to see those. And the other thing is this, um, COVID-19 has brought with it a number of horrors in our, our world. But one thing it has done for me is it has given me the opportunity to provide virtual trainings. And I can tell you that I was super resistant to doing that prior to uh, COVID-19. I said, I want to be in the room with people. But these intensives have been really exciting. And in part, it's because you can break up those units of study into small lessons and have people build competence rather than seven and a half hours in a room with people um, doing the same thing. So it's been really exciting. These are limited to 25 people. And if you get interested in something like that, if you want to take a deeper dive and a deeper look and explore what we've been talking about, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, we filled 14 sections so far this summer, and I'm about to open new sections. So I thought we'd fill one or two. And I guess people are either restless at home uh, with COVID-19 or they are super excited about syntax, which is what I hope is happening. Uh, and so that, that interest has been overwhelming and really exciting for me. So I've also got some citations for you uh, uh, on handwriting, on uh, sentence work, uh, et cetera, that I think you'll find useful. And that's it for the slideshow. So I'm super happy to take any questions or comments during the remaining 13 minutes. Great, we do have a lot of comments, just how appreciative people are, are with the presentation and how much they're enjoying your style. Um, in addition to that, a uh, question is, um, I wanted to know when you feel that this explicit grammar instruction should begin. Is it the middle, the end of kindergarten, or not until first grade? Um, and then um, thinking, you had also mentioned about some introducing some of these concepts in like a shared reading activity. Maybe those two can be combined. Great. When, mm -hmm. Okay, so first, 
I do think um, I've just got a shared screen up here in case I want to write something for you guys. I thought I'd have a shared screen and that would help us out. So there's nothing on it. So you're not missing out on anything, everybody. All right. Um, so I think uh, kindergartners can do a little bit of this. Um, and I'd be inclined to do things like, hey, did you notice some people, places, and things in that sentence? Let's talk about those. And by the way, those are called nouns. And sort of to incidentally introduce the vocabulary. What the vocabulary research says is we should talk at our level and explain. So I don't have a problem with using words like noun and verb with five-year-olds. I don't know that I'm going to be quizzing and drilling them on their knowledge of those words. I'm going to be using those words to talk about the language. Um, we could also tie this into a phonics concept. So let's say, for example, that we are um, studying the vowel team. I'm trying to think of something. Um, well, no, let me go, let me go simpler. Uh, we're talking about kindergarten. Maybe we're studying short vowel uh, O. And we've learned that it says, ah, and I might have them read a list of short vowel O words, and they could identify the ones that show an action or show that they are verbs. That'd be another way to play around with this with kids. I also do some oral language sentence combining. So I might say the man went to the store and all the kids would repeat back to me, the man went to the store. And then I would say, the man was ugly. And the kids would all go, the man was ugly. And they'd probably giggle at that point. And then we would do a combine and they would say, the ugly man went to the store. So, and that doesn't involve any paper, any pencil, no handwriting, no spelling. We're just working that oral language and that sentence combining piece for kids. So I think there are a lot of ways to think about the function of words and the way they relate and the way they think about things. Now, one final thing, the subject predicate sentence frames where I talked about the bear that is an activity I would do with very young children. You can do that with five-year-olds. I am using the term subject and predicate, but I'm also interweaving the terms doer and do. So I'm using both and we're framing that discussion and we're building them off of pictures and visuals. And again, I'm doing the writing for most of those unless they're ready to do some of the writing. And that usually happens uh, you know, after the winter break in the spring, if, if at all. Um, Karen, there may have been a second part to your question that I overlooked. Uh, just would those things be introduced in younger students, maybe in a shared reading mm. um, part of the day versus a direct explicit instruction? And I think you did address that. Okay, cool. Okay, the second question, is there a certain order that's best to teach these? And is it in the order that you presented these today in your presentation? Okay, so that's a complicated question. I did not do all of the parts of speech in this presentation. An hour and 15 minutes is not enough to cover all this content, obviously. I would tell you that the clause part of the workshop, I did do in the order I teach it. So I do subjects and predicates, we do clauses, and then we start to put clauses into different kinds of sentences. The parts of speech, there is a sequence, and I can tell you if you're a Pennsylvania person, we have a scope and sequence, uh, an optional scope and sequence that's available on the patent website that shows you which grades different things come up in. Um, and I think that could help you frame your discussion. And that's a free download. I'm pretty sure non-patent people can access that, can't they, Karen? Absolutely. That's what I thought. Okay. So, so anybody uh, all over the country can access that. That is one scope and sequence. Um, I think what I found is this. There's a way to vary, like you might have a slightly different scope and sequence from a teacher in another school, and I think that's okay. But I also think that it makes sense to check in with some other scopes and sequences. I don't know what that's called. Other people's scope and sequence to verify that you're on the right track. So for example, if you're a ninth grade teacher and at your school you discover that no one introduces nouns until ninth grade, that's a hiccup, right? And it's probably one we want to address. Okay, great. Is there a book that you recommend for kindergarten teachers around this topic? Um, that's a good question. So um, I do have a product I carry um, and it's for very, very primary level uh, students and it's called Bare Bones Grammar. That's fun and cool. There's also, uh, what's the, the one that they've been uh, suggesting in letters sometimes, Karen? Do you know the name of it? I do not know off my head. Uh, it's somebody's name. Anyway, uh, that's gotten a lot of good press. I think that's good. I can also tell you all that for the youngest kids, I like Framing Your Thoughts. Uh, Tori Green stuff is great. Um, Step Up to uh, Writing also has a great curriculum and a scope and sequence um, that's laid out. But that would be a whole full-on syntax curriculum, which may not be the choice that some schools are taking. 
Okay. If people had questions about your courses, they can reach out to you by email. Is that correct? Yes. And my email's on uh, the front slide, I think, or my website is. Um, my email's on uh, the back slide as well. Uh, so you can reach me. I'd be happy to do that with you guys. I would love to hear from you. Okay. We had a participant was curious about what you were doing with your hands. I think with the um, subordinating. Oh, you know that and again? they see my hands more now. Or If I unshare, they can see my hands better. Is that right? I think so, yes. Okay, let me do that, and I'll do that one more time. That's a, that, I'm sorry. I never know what people can see. I'm so focused on what I, okay. So, no, wait, can they see you, or can they see me big now? They do not see. Uh, you would have to go to speaker view on the top of okay. the, not you, but your participants. Um, no. Yeah, so, yes, if you would get a, hit that button at the top of the page, you'll see you as big as their screen. So, right now, if I, there's a speaker view, exit full screen at the top of my page. So if I click on that, I'll be able to see you bigger. But I don't think it's anything that you can particularly do. Okay. Yeah, you're on full screen now. So if you go up there, it's what either What do you want there. me to do? I don't think you need to do anything. If the participant wants to see you, um, they can- Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's the deal, folks. It's a cool concept. And I do the fist thing with kids too. So I tell them that a coordinating conjunction keeps the two pieces on either side of it on equal footing. So, uh, so if I say, uh, I don't know, Mary and Juan did something, okay? So Mary and Juan are equal footing. Neither is more important than the other, okay? Or if I say, we could go to the beach or to the movies, Okay, again, neither is more important. I'm not showing priority. Those are coordinating conjunctions and they keep either part on equal footing and they're good for little kids. They're easy, they're straightforward. Kids don't tend to have a lot of problem with them. Okay, now, when we got into the words I called the most important words, I called those subordinating conjunctions. So what I did was I said, if a clause or a group of words starts with a subordinating conjunction, that's different because that's gonna send this part underneath the main part. It's not as important and even cooler, it leans on the main part for support. So that's what I was doing with that. And subordinated conjunctions only have one job. They start these dependent clauses. That's their only job. Coordinated conjunctions have lots of different things they join, but subordinated conjunctions have only one job and they send that piece underneath. So if I say, um, I have a headache, because I have not had enough water. That because I have not had enough water is down here leaning on the independent clause. Okay, so that's that piece. I hope that helps a little bit with people and I'm sorry they couldn't see my hands. That's okay. So um, we have only just a few minutes less left to uh, wrap this up, William. Um, is it okay if people would reach out to you with any other additional questions? Sure. Um, if it's a simple question, I get back to people within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. If it's a longer multi-part question and you don't hear from me in several days, I don't have uh, an office person. So you may want to email me again and say, hey, were you planning to get back to me? And that would prod me to get back to a longer, more multi-part question. I hope you folks had a really good time. I love talking about this and sharing ideas about it. And I hope it gives you something you can take away uh, and go back to your classrooms and, and use with students. Thank you, William. That really was wonderful. Lots of positive feedback I'm getting in the chat today. And I know that folks will may want to follow up with you with some additional things. So wonderful. No worries. So thank you. And for everybody that's attended this session today, this session was recorded and will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the future. The Patent Literacy team will also be creating supports aligned to this presentation at the symposium to maximize the learning for families and educators. Um, in order to be eligible for a certificate, even if you don't want Act 48, just proof of attendance, please um, go to the Schoology folder at the end of this day. Uh, you do need to attend the opening keynote, uh, a concurrent session per time slot, and in order to get Act 48 for today, and this must be completed by midnight Friday, June 19th, 2020. Our next session begins after lunch at 2 o'clock. Um, again, I'd like to uh, really uh, thank uh, William Van Cleve and all of you for joining our session today.